the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I just want to do a quick video and kind of uh, address some of the comments the, that, um, that some of the viewers have left. And, um, you know, with the traditional rite and the new rite of the Mass, um, I didn't realize this was going to turn into a, um, how do I say, uh, you know, a long conversation or anything. I, you know, I, 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 in the comments, I tried to make the points that I was trying to make in the video. Um, but there are some other things that have come up and um, that I wanted to address and just kind of talk about a little bit. And so the, the point that I was trying to make in the video that I did previously was that returning to the Latin Mass in this day and age is not going to change the corruption in the church, uh, nor is it going to change um, the belief among quote unquote, faithful Catholics of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And, and I think, um, you know, what I did was I, I, I don't see this as a new problem and it comes really from scripture and just a little bit of history and things like that. So, so there are some things I wanted to point out. Um, I want to go to the scriptures and then I want to, you know, kind of go through a little bit of history here. And then, uh, at the end of the thing, um, address the title uh, Tierra de Cielo because that's something that's kind of come up too, you know, with wondering whether or not, you know, Pope Francis, was, you know, is this a, a, uh, a reference to Mary? And so, um, because it is used, from what I understand um, or come to understand, by the New Age and by earth worshipers and things like that. Now, before I begin, I will say this. Um, I absolutely in no way under any shape or form agree with what happened with the Pachamama statue in St. Peter's. I think it was an abomination and I think it was idol worship. At the same time, I am not going to make a judgment on whether or not Pope Francis went along with all of that um, seemingly unworried and... and uh, you know, just nonchalantly allowed it to happen. And the reason that I say that is because there are a lot of things that go on in the Vatican that we as uh, lay people don't know about. Um, you got people whispering in their ear, don't say Russia because it could offend or for, you know, political reasons. And there are people within the church in the hierarchy of the church that want to do it damage that act as a, you know, a little whisper um, in the ear. And I guess the... The example that I would use for that is um, Archbishop uh, Carlos, Carlos Maria Vigano. This man's basically in hiding in fear of his life. And so when you have those kinds of things going on where an archbishop is actually afraid to come out because he fears for his life, um, when you have people like George Soros, and I don't know if he was just bragging or... Um, uh, making it up, but he's been quoted as saying, I'm so powerful that I can even control the Pope. Being where we're at in the world and the way the political things move and the amount of corruption in every government and even in the church, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. Um, I, I, in my opinion, okay, <laughs> I could not agree with, uh, you know, hardline traditionalists more about the Papa Mach uh, Pachamama statue and what happened there. It was an absolute abomination. And some of the pictures that I saw um, caused me great pain that things would be going on like that in the church. But I will tell you this as well. It's going to get worse. Okay. Um, it's going to get worse. And so we need to pray for the Pope. We need to pray for the bishops. We need to pray for um, unity and peace. Um, there are a lot of things that, that uh, traditionalists and our, you know, our uh, conservatives and liberals agree on. And there are some things that they just completely disagree on. Um, but the idea, I think, is to try to find common ground among those who know that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, whether it be in the Latin Rite or in the Nor Norvisodo Ordo Mass. 
Um, one of the things that I did mention in the last video, and it was when I came back into the church, I had read a statistic. It was something like, you know, 75 or 92 percent of Catholics, something like that in the United States, no longer believed in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And I found that stunning um, and, and actually motivated me to speak on the Eucharist um, every opportunity that I got. And what it, what it drove me to do was to look into scriptures. And, and, uh, and what I found, you know, I don't think it's anything new. I think there are more people, okay, in the church. So you have a higher number of those who don't believe or those who um, would receive in a state of mortal sin or not uh, do a good self-examination of conscience and go to confession and receive the Eucharist, approach the Eucharist as we are approaching the King of Kings, because that's in fact what we are doing. And so what I decided to do was to go back into the scriptures and look at this, <coughs> excuse me, as well as um, just some historical things. And uh, the first thing I want to um, hit on here comes from the letter of the, uh, to the Corinthians from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians. And it is the uh, tradition of the institution, okay? One of the comments that were left was that we're taught by Paul to hold fast to the traditions that were handed on, okay? Now, in Paul's day, again, the Latin rite didn't um, exist. And so Paul was not talking in any way, shape, or form about the Latin mass. He was talking about the traditions that were handed on by the apostles. Now, with... Latin being the common language of the time when the rite was put together, there was a reason for that. And I think a very good reason for that, okay? And traditionally, the, the, the language of the church has been Latin, okay? But when you, when you expand over the entire world, right? I know very, very, very good priests that would have never been able to be ordained had not... The, the mass been allowed to be said in English because they they suffer from certain um, ailments that prohibit them from learning uh, Latin or reading Latin. And so, you know, it makes me, there's a, there's a pro and a con to this. And I understand, I completely understand where the traditionalists are coming from. But to place all the blame on Vatican II for disbelief in the Eucharist is not right. And so that's the thing I, I really want to point out because it has to do with the person. It has to do with the open heart. And I think what's happened is we have lost, um, we don't hear good preaching from the pulpit. We don't hear uh, preaching that is, is literally the power of the spirit working through the man preaching in order to convict hearts and bring about conversion. That's, that's why I say I think evangelization um, from that standpoint would be a, a, a very good thing to start happening. So with that being said, I'm gonna move into this uh, first letter. And um, this is the first letter of Corinthians, St. Paul, um, chapter 11, starting at verse 23. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. This is one of the traditions that he handed on, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was handed over took bread and after, he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the, this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. And we hear this. This is part of the, of the, uh, of the, um, of the Mass. We hear these words in the Mass. But this is, where, this is where I want to make the point, and it comes from 27 down. He says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and the blood of the Lord. So he's warning him there. And then he goes on, he says, a person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who drinks or eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And what this means, what he's talking about is coming before the Lord without discerning who we are, the sinful state that we're in, or receiving in a state of mortal sin, just treating it as a meal rather than the true 
um, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, and this is the most important part of the point that I'm trying to make. Verse 30, that is why many of you are ill and infirm, and a considerable number are dying. If we discerned ourselves, we would not be under judgment. But since we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. In other words, according to St. Paul, when 1 Corinthians was written to the church of Corinth, there were many of his followers that were sick and were ill and were infirm and were dying because they were receiving the Lord unworthily. In other words, they didn't truly believe that the Lord Jesus was present in the bread and in the cup. If they had, they would be discerning the body, okay? Discerning themselves. But this is exactly what he says. So what I'm trying to point out here is this is nothing new. Now keep in mind, the church was much smaller then than it is now. They were having the same problem and this is why Paul was writing to Corinth on this subject of the institution of the Eucharist. So they had people that were not discerning their own body, not discerning themselves. They were treating the Eucharist as a meal rather than the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So this isn't a new problem. It, uh, again, it's probably expanded more. The, the percentages are higher, but that's because the church is bigger, okay? So that was one point I wanna make. It's nothing new, it's not a new problem. Um, the second one I want to make was um, comes from 1939. That was the uh, outbreak or when they consider World War II had started. Now, St. Faustina's diary was written in 39, or St. Faustina began to write her diary during the period of World War II. Let me rephrase that and make sure that I'm, that I'm clear on it. Okay, so Faustina wrote the diary. She was receiving these things from Jesus, a canonized saint, um, no errors found, and the two miracles presented to John Paul by Father Seraphim McLenko. World War II officially started in 1939, Vatican II, 1962. So the diary was written before Vatican II. And I want to read one of the quotes that Jesus told uh, Faustina. And it comes from the diary... Entry number 1447. So keep in mind, this is before Vatican II. The only thing being said was the Latin Mass. The Norvus Oder hadn't, hadn't come into play, as far as I know, because we hadn't had Vatican II yet. So I'm going to quote Jesus. He says, Oh, how painful it is to me that souls so seldom unite themselves to me in Holy Communion. How painful it is to me that souls so seldom unite themselves to me in Holy Communion. I wait for souls, and they are indifferent toward me. I want to lavish my graces on them, and they do not want to accept them. They treat me as a dead object, whereas my heart is full of love and mercy. In order that you may know at least some of my pain, imagine the most tender of mothers who has great love for her children, while those children spurn her love. Consider her pain. No one is in a position to console her. This is but a feeble image and likeness of my love. I want to read one part of that over again. I want to lavish my graces on them and they do not want to accept them. They treat me as a dead object. The new mass didn't exist when Faustina was writing this diary. Only the Latin mass. Only Jesus knows hearts. Only Jesus knows if the person coming to receive communion or kneeling at the rail and receiving communion from the priest on the tongue only Jesus knows if they truly believe. And so the, the point that I was trying to make in the last video that I did when I spoke about the Latin rite and the new rite 
is that returning to the Latin rite is not going to fix the church. Conversion is. And from reading St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, it seems they were having those problems early on to the point that people were actually sick, ill, infirm, and some of them dying. And Paul saw this as them being under judgment. It was a discipline. He was disciplining the church in Corinth for not treating the Eucharist reverently or not even believing at all. As I said, if the early church, if these people in Corinth that Paul was writing about truly believed, then they would be discerning themselves and they would be approaching and they would not be sick, they would not be ill, infirm, and they would not be dying. But Paul sees this as a judgment and a discipline that God is trying to give them. And this is the very reason is because they are treating, as Jesus said to Faustina, the Eucharist as a dead object. Now again, 1939 is the official date that World War II started. Vatican II didn't start until 1962. Yet Jesus says, they treat me as a dead object. And how seldom so many souls, keep in mind, in the Latin rite, come and want to unite themselves with him. This is nothing new. The amount of Catholics has increased. That's what's new. I would agree with traditionalists that Vatican II opened up um, the church to a lot of errors that weren't there before. But I don't think it's due to Vatican II. I think it's due to clergy uh, that took on Vatican II and think they can do whatever they want with it. They can turn it into a circus. Um, I will admit that I have seen a lot more quote unquote accidents with the Eucharist uh, in the new mass than I have ever witnessed in the Latin mass. But I will also say that when I was in Medjugorje and I went to the new mass there, it was by far the most reverent mass I have ever seen in my life. When the priest elevated the host, you could have heard a pin drop. So it has, from, from my perspective and in my opinion, it has nothing to do with the rite. It has everything to do with how the people are approaching the Eucharist. As I said, Faustina's diary was written in World War II, during World War II. Vatican II didn't happen till after. These are the words of Jesus. So even in the Latin rite, they were being corrected by Jesus himself through the writings of St. Faustina. The last point I want to make, or the last thing I want to talk about, and I don't know the answer to this, um, but I did see some questions on it. Um, the phrase in the prayer that Pope Francis said in the consecration of Russia um, in certain language, languages was Tierra de Cielo. Um, from what I understand, that phrase was also used by saints. It's also used by some New Age people. The question that I would like to know the answer to, maybe you guys can help me out with it. Um, I know one of our viewers is a, a, a real good at homework, but one of the things that I would ask is, is the New Age using our language with that phrase or is Pope Francis using their language? Do you see what I mean? So if, if in other words, if the New Age, the earth worshipers took this from the church and decided to use it for earth worship, that doesn't necessarily mean that Pope Francis, when he was using this, was referring to Mother Earth, okay? Because there are saints in the past who have used this as uh, this phrase as a reference or something very close to this phrase as a reference to the Blessed Mother. So anyway, maybe you guys can help me out with the answer on that. Um, I'm really glad that there are some traditionalist Catholics here um, that love the Eucharist. I can tell just by their comments, love Jesus in the Eucharist just as much as I do and um, just as much as we all do. And uh, so I thought the prayer that Pope Francis did was beautiful and I'm glad this has been done. Um, I would also say, and just a word of caution, this isn't a magic potion. And I, I would look 
again, for things to get worse before they get better. And, uh, you know, if we think the number, you know, 92% or whatever it is of Catholics in the United States no longer believe in the Eucharist is bad, if we think what some priests are doing with the new Mass is bad, I'm telling you right now, you know what? Hold on to faith and hold on to the teachings of the church because it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse. May God bless you. May you <laughs> May God bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, and may he grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.